pleasure to to be here. Um, I've I've been admiring the the effort to maintain a, a kind of global online seminar even after after we all go to our local seminars. Um, uh, so it's it's a pleasure. Um, what I want to do today is to talk about uh, some things that my colleagues and I are very excited about. Um, <clears throat> let me make a couple of preparatory remarks. Uh, to begin, um, many of you know that there's been an enormous uh, effort in the physics community uh, to do what has come to be called the physics of behavior. Um, so trying to look at uh, the behavior of animals in, uh, well, let's say more natural conditions than has been traditional in the laboratory. And to do this with very high throughput measurements, sophisticated analyses, long recordings, and so on. And it's really been um, a sort of revolution in our ability to characterize animal behavior, which had been stuck in many ways in, in things, uh, well, I guess we can now say from the previous century, but it, it really went back um, quite far. I think if you brought some of the pioneers of our subject back from the sort of teleported them from the 1890s to the 1990s, they would have they would have recognized what people were doing when they did experiments in animal behavior, whereas they wouldn't have recognized uh, experiments that people were doing, uh, let's say, in exploring the brain itself. Um, let me also say that I'm going to give you um, a very phenomenological talk. Um, so I'm a theorist, but there, there won't be a theory. Um, there'll be observate analyses and observations, which I think point us toward a theory. Um, but convincing ourselves that these things are true is a hard job. And so um, that's that's what the topic for today will be. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, about evidence for scale invariance in the dynamics of animal behavior. And in particular, I'm going to talk about it in the context of the behavior of walking flies. Um, the reason for talking about it in the context of, of walking flies is because there are these fantastic experiments that are going on and that have been going on now for some time in Josh Shavitz's group um, at Princeton. They began when Gordon Berman was a postdoc with us and he drove um, a lot of the theoretical analysis, and most of the theoretical analysis, but also uh, sort of provided the motivation for the experiments. And later on, we were joined uh, by a PhD student, Vasil Alba, who's now, now at Northwestern. And as you'll see, um, the essential difficulty that we need to resolve is that um, there is a tang entangling of notions of memory or long time correlations in behavior with the fact that different animals are have individual differences. Um, and one way of thinking about that is that you have an infinitely long memory for your own identity. Um, and so that is somehow that is interesting, but is not the same thing as the claim that you as an individual have internal dynamics with long memories. And so we're going to have to figure out how to how to disentangle those things. So let me start with with a simple observation, which is that many living systems um, have dynamics across many scales in time. Um, I've chosen uh, for simplicity or for intuition uh, an example from language, right? You know that uh, when we're speaking, language is built out of phonemes. Phonemes get together to form syllables. Syllables form words. We string together words into phrases and sentences, which hopefully get organized into paragraphs. Um, and we go uh, here across, if you think about how long it takes to say this, you're spanning, I mean, phonemes are have durations measured in tens of milliseconds. Um, reciting a paragraph uh, could take uh, a minute. Um, uh, an actor standing on stage and reciting um, a soliloquy could, of course, take many, many, many minutes. Um, so there are many orders of magnitude as we go across. We also go from things which are features of the raw acoustic waveform um, all the way to things which are very abstract. Um, so uh, one possible, and, and of course, I, I chose language not because I know how to do it. Um, well, it, except in the sense that we all know how to use language. I mean, I don't know how to do the theory, underlying theory, uh, but it is a sort of intuitively accessible example where you can see that in a single behavioral context, um, an organism, in this case, people, 
uh, do things that are spread out over many, many orders of magnitude in time. And, and it's challenging to think about that. Of course, there are many other examples. Um, and often when we're faced with examples that span a wide range of time scales, we imagine that the scales are discrete. Um, and we imagine that associated to each scale, there's a, there's a separate mechanism that, that's, that is tied to that time scale. So you can think about you know, things in a single cell that involve biochemical modifications like phosphorylation or uh, methylation of DNA. Um, then there are the things that require um, that require protein synthesis. There are the things that require transport um, to different parts of the cell. There are the things that um, you know involve long transcriptional programs that lead to differentiation of cells. There are cells moving around and so on. And and the way you get from you know you would never suggest that you should get from uh, sort of biochemistry to all of embryonic development in one in one scheme. You'd say no 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 no. There are many things that bridge those time scales. On the other hand, we know from many examples in physics that if you take a large number of degrees of freedom and you let them interact with each other, they generate, even if the characteristic timescales of the individual degrees of freedom are short and relatively similar to one another, together they can collectively generate a very broad range of timescales. Just think about, you know, think about the, the vibrational frequency of two atoms connected to each other versus the entire spectrum of sound waves in a solid. And um, in some cases, uh, the different scale, not only do you generate a large number of scales, but the way in which uh, weight is distributed across those scales means that they're almost equally represented. And this leads to a kind of scale invariance. And uh, as I think most of you will know, scale invariance is somehow very evocative for physicists. And so let me say a few words um, about where this comes from. So let's imagine that um, what you, you're characterizing some system and there's a variable we can call X and you measure the correlation. You're, this, you're not perturbing the system. You're just letting it sit there and you're watching it go through its internal dynamics and um, which presumably not completely quiescent. So there's something going on. Um, and you, you characterize these dynamics by measuring a correlation function. So there are two very different possibilities. One is that if you measure these correlations, they decay, as shown in the blue curve, um, uh, exponentially. You'll notice that this is um, sort of a funny way to show an exponential decay. This is a log-log plot, right? If you want to show an exponential decay, you should really shoot, use a log-linear plot where it'll be a straight line. Um, but this emphasizes that um, there really is a, a characteristic time associated with the exponential decay, which is, of course, the correlation time. On the other hand, um, you could measure correlations that uh, have a power law decay, um, as shown in the red. Um, and then there are many consequences to this. One is that there's no obvious characteristic time scale. Um, and the other is that in, in some qualitative sense, the decay is very gradual, that um, you can go from across three orders of magnitude from seconds to hours, um, and you see um, you know, only a factor of 10 decay, whereas uh, really, in the exponential case, when you go from a little bit less than the correlation time to a little bit more than the correlation time, um, over that factor of two or so, you see a decay, which is almost as large. So um, let me, because it's going to be important, let me be very explicit about this. Um, it is at the risk of saying things that many of you already know, but um, just as a reminder, when you see these kinds of exponential decays, and, and let me emphasize, having it be precisely exponential isn't really the crucial issue. Um, it's the fact that there is a single characteristic time for the dynamics, which we refer to as the correlation time. Um, the other possibility is the power law, which, um, which I showed, as, as, as I emphasized, doesn't actually have a characteristic time. Um, and so, in that sense, there, there is no unique time scale for describing the dynamics. You see this thing, you can't say this is a process that occurs on a time scale of 10 seconds because, um, well, there's stuff going on on all, all time scales and the decay is very gradual. Um, I think all, almost everybody in the audience probably knows this. Some of you may not remember or um, 
or may not be familiar with, with why this is called scale invariant. Um, so let me be a little bit more explicit. And the key is to remember that units are arbitrary. So this variable X that you decided to observe, nobody told you what units to measure it in. So suppose you change your units and divide by X zero. Similarly, um, although X was, I didn't even tell you what it was. So the fact that you don't know the units, that's obvious. Actually, you don't know the units of time either. Um, you can choose whatever units you want. Um, so let's imagine that you measure units in, in uh, time in units of T zero. Well, then if you have a power law decay and you rescale your variables in this way, changing your units, you notice that you get back essentially the same answer, but with a constant out in front. And in particular, if you choose the scale on which you measure the variable X to be related to the scale on which you measure time, then it doesn't matter what units you use. And in that sense, things are scale invariant. You will see if you keep your units related to one another, then the behavior that you see will be exactly scale invariant. Um, a familiar example of this is things that are controlled by diffusion, where it's, it's natural to measure um, uh, positions in units that grow, uh, that, are, that are related to time to the one half, right? And then um, the behaviors that you see um, will be invariant to your choice of this time scale. And the, the, so the technical jargon is that if you have this kind of behavior, it's scale invariant. And because you only get this true scale invariance, if you link the um, units of X to the units of time, we say that delta is the dimension, is, is like the dimension of X, right? Um, and it's called the scaling dimension. Um, so this is familiar, right? If you, if you change your units of length, you better change your units of volume and delta better be three, uh, but this is more general, right? So somehow when you change your units of time, you should change the units in which you measure X and there is an exponent that relates those to one another and that's like a, a dimensionality. Okay, so that's the background. Um, let's, let's talk about animal behavior. Let's go compute correlation functions and see what they look like. Well, okay, not so easy. So you see a fly walking around in a big arena. Um, what are you going to do? Well, um, the fly's got lots of legs, lots of joints. It can move its wings. It can move its head. Of course, it can translate at different rates. Um, you would like to discover whether there's some underlying simplicity in this. Um, and this was the effort that Gordon led now getting to be 10 years ago. Um, as some of you will realize, um, a decade here is not only um, a long time in an absolute sense, it's also prehistoric in the sense that this is before the deep learning revolution. So um, this was all done, uh, as it were, by hand. And today, if you're doing it again, you would use a variety of neural network-based methods. Um, we can talk about what difference that makes. Um, the part that I'm going to be interested in, actually, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, which is interesting, and, and we could discuss that if people are curious. So what's the idea? You watch, um, you watch a fly walking around. You do it at very high resolution, so you can make out all the individual joints um, and so on. And in this version, instead of trying to describe the fly, for instance, by all the joint angles, the wing angles, and so on, um, what Gordon did was to just say, let's take these as images. Let's align them. Um, and let's notice that if they're aligned, um, you can easily discover that even in a linear sense, um, the dimensionality of the variation of these images is much lower than the number of pixels. So you can restrict yourself to perhaps 50 dimensions. These 50 dimensions have interesting time courses. Um, of course, right, walking is a periodic thing, right? You have a, you have a rhythm associated with the, with the steps. And so you can see all of that in these 50 dimensions. 
And one way of visualizing that is to take the spectrograms um, of each of these. So, you know, a plot where you have uh, the power at a frequency as a function of time, the same thing we do when we listen to sound, when we analyze sounds. And then you can take um, in each small window of time, um, a spectrogram at which is, so technically uh, he actually did a wavelet transform rather than a Fourier transform. Um, but basically you're looking at spectrotemporal features of these 50 dimensions of variation in a window of order of one second. Your, your movies are at 100 frames per second. Um, and uh, you then find that these um, spectrograms can be embedded in a lower dimensional space non-linearly, right? So the first step was a linear dimensionality reduction. Now you do a non-linear dimensionality reduction. And what you observe is that when you look in that lower dimensional space, you see peaks separated by troughs and the dynamics actually consists of the fly visiting this point in space, hovering around for a while and then jumping to one over here, similarly staying there, jumping to one over here. As you might guess, they spend longer in this region than they did in this region and so on. Um, and so the probability distribution of animal movements in this space has lots of peaks. And it makes sense to think of those peaks as being behavioral states. And so this, these are examples of how you do this. And then you, you, of course, need to, what this essentially has done is to take a little segment of the video and say, this is state number 17. But of course, state number 17, because of the way we construct it, you're guaranteed that state number 17 appears many, many times over the course of an hour of watching even a single fly. And so you can go back and, and, and look at all of those. And first of all, convince yourself that the thing you call the state really makes sense. It's the same thing happening in each little video clip. Um, and you can identify them. Some of them are walking. Some of them are movements um, of the backside. Some of them are movements of the wings. Um, some of them are anterior movements, um, including grooming movements, right? Flies do this uh, wonderful thing where they take their leg and clean stuff off of their eyes and so on. And if you dig into each of these, you can make contact with you know, a century of behavioral literature on, on flies where you say, oh, that's the thing that people described as being this. Um, but of course, if you do this, there's a hundred states and there aren't a hundred things in the literature. Um, but it's sort of, I think this is kind of the best possible outcome of a modern analysis of behavior, which is that you can recapitulate everything that everybody's already seen, but you also find new stuff. If you're really interested in understanding fly behavior and how it's implemented by neurons and so on, then you care a lot about exactly what all these things are. Um, for what I'm gonna do today, the, the take home message is that if you're watching a fly walking around, what it is doing is visiting um, roughly a hundred discrete states each of which corresponds to a fairly stereotyped behavior. And it visits those repeatedly, but stochastically. But it's also clear when you first look at the data that um, those stochastic visits to the different states, they're, so they're not precise sequences, um, it's stochastic, but it's also true that there are correlations that extend um, quite far in time. So those are the things we're gonna try and disentangle. Um, this has been, um, you know, 10 years ago, um, my colleagues and I were giving talks just about, you know, we could spend an hour on what, what happens in this slide, right? But it's published um, uh, now for quite some time. Um, so let me leave that here, that, that we can go from the behavior of freely moving animals to this uh, sequence of discrete states. And one of the things I want to emphasize, and this is this is the revolution of an instant, this is an example of the revolution in the physics of behavior, is that we're finding the underlying simplicity in the unconstrained behavior. So you don't have to ask the fly or constrain him in uh, some way to do only a limited number of things, perhaps in response to particular sensory stimuli or so on. Um, it, it will naturally um, engage in this structured behavior. Um, and so that's, 
that's nice because it means you can now make progress. So let's actually um, say, well, we want to, we see this sequence, we would like to characterize the correlations as they extend in time. So how are we going to do that? Um, you could think about lots of different ways of doing it. Let me let me do something that's as close as possible to com computing correlation functions. So let's define, right? You're going through a sequence of discrete states. Um, if there were only two states, you could call them spin up and spin down. Um, but since there's 100 of them, actually 123 or something like that, um, you have to be a little more uh, um, a little more careful. So let's define a variable which is one if that fly is in that particular state and zero otherwise. So um, I guess this is sometimes called a one-hot representation, right? So basically the state of the system is a vector, but the vector consists of one entry, which is one, and all the rest are zeros. So this is a perfectly good variable. It's related to what you do in POTS models and things like that. Um, people use this sort of representation for thinking about amino acid sequences and proteins and so on. Um, so great, if you have this, um, this is the state of the system at time t uh, indexed by uh, what state you're in and which fly you are. Um, and so you compute the correlations between that state at time t and the corresponding state at time t prime. There's a hundred different states, so maybe you don't care about which one's which. That's a sort of level of detail you'd like to get past. And of course, you'd also like to average over all the flies that you look at so that you get better statistics. Um, if you work it out, because this is a one zero representation, this quantity is actually the probability that a that any fly in your ensemble will return at time t prime to whatever state it was in at time t. And so that's a kind of natural, this sort of recurrence probability also is a natural measure of correlation, right? Do I do, am I more likely to be doing the same thing 10 seconds in the future um, than you might expect at random? So that's a measure that I must be remembering something about what I'm doing now. The problem with all this is that while these are correlation functions, they are not, if you want to use the um, technical language, they're not connected correlation functions. Um, you all know that if you want to talk about correlations, you should subtract the mean. And obviously, um, these quantities being one and zero have zero mean. Um, in fact, if you think about it, the mean of this variable is the probability that the fly is in state i, um, right? Because it's one zero representation. So somehow you need to subtract off the means. So let's go back to our simple example with correlation functions and think about what we do when we subtract the means. And suppose that the real correlations are actually exponentially decaying, characterized by a single correlation time, which in this case will take to be 10 seconds. So what do I do? I give you a one hour long record. And you say to yourself, let's see, an hour, that's 3,600 seconds. The correlation time is 10 seconds. So I've got many hundreds of independent samples. My window of time is very much larger than my correlation time. So I should be able to say the thing that I think of as the average is the average over time, which is the average over this one hour window. But remember, that means that if you, if you are, um, if the thing that you subtract as the mean, is the average over a window of size capital T, then on the scale capital T, there are zero fluctuations because you've agreed that that's the mean. And this distorts your correlate estimate of the correlation function in the way shown by this red curve. And in fact, um, it induces artifactual anti-correlations at long times and long, is not that much longer than the correlation time. So you just do the calculation and this is what you get. So then you say, oh, okay, that was a bad idea. Um, and by the way, you might ask yourself, why doesn't this happen when I compute correlation functions in statistical mechanics? Well, first of all, in statistical mechanics, I have a theory of what the probability distribution is out of which my samples are being drawn. And the thing that I subtract is the mean computed in the probability distribution. 
And you say, okay, but what about if you do an experiment? Well, if you do an experiment, remember that you do experiments on macroscopic quantities of things. So if you think about trying to measure the spin-spin correlation function in, um, in a magnet, remember that the length scales that you have, even if you only have a micron of a micron cubed of material, the length scales are still three orders of magnitude longer than the interatomic spacings. And so it's very easy to get yourself into a situation where the number of samples that you have really is orders and orders and orders of magnitude longer than the correlation time or the correlation length. And so this problem just doesn't come up, right? If you, if you held the correlation time fixed at 10 seconds and you took one hour to be one day, then this problem would go away. The problem is that in experiments on animals, you can't do that, or at least there's some limit. Okay, everybody who does experiments on animal behavior doesn't do experiments on one animal, they do it on many animals. So you could say, ah, I can do better than taking the average over time. I can take the average across the different subjects in the experiment, the different animals, and use that as an estimate of my mean. The problem with that, of course, is that there might actually be differences among the subjects, differences among the individuals. And if those differences make up only 1% of the total variance that you're observing, then things are distorted in the way shown by the green curve. You'll notice the plateau here is at 1%. And again, you don't see the thing that you expected to see. And actually, you might say, well, I can see the beginning of it, but it really starts to depart as soon as you're one correlation time or two correlation times away, things are starting to move away from the real thing. So the hope of observing a correlation function across a few or maybe even 10 correlation times completely out the window in either of these cases. This was the case where correlations decay exponentially. If they decay as a power law, then it's even worse. So first of all, things can't be power laws for all times. They have to get cut off somehow at short times, maybe also at long times, but let's do the case where they only get cut off at short times. So even if the true power law looks like this, in a real system, you, the, the underlying correlation function might look like the blue curve so that the power law is only asymptotic. And then if you do the thing of subtracting the mean, you get the red, uh, over time, you get the red curve. And if you do the thing of subtracting the mean across individuals, again, with 1%, uh, individual variation, um, then you get the green curve. And you can see that this is just hopeless, right? There's no way that some nice power law is going to pop out at you from the data. Um, so when people tell you that they looked at the correlation function and they saw something that, you know, looked vaguely exponential, well, maybe that's just because, um, you know, because of these effects, you can never see anything very clean and you focus, you know, if I now add noise to the measurement, you focus only over here, um, and uh, that's that. You don't have any shot at, at really observing what's going on underneath, even with a large amount of data. Okay, so what's the point? If you have long-range correlations, so something I didn't emphasize is that if you have long-range correlations, you also never have truly independent samples, right? If correlations decay as a power law, then um, the uh, correlations even of points separated by an hour can be very can be su significant, um, uh, even if the characteristic time is uh, well. If there is no characteristic time and it's a power law, then you know being uh, correlations over an hour are only um, a modest fraction smaller than correlations over a minute. A consequence of the fact that there aren't independent samples is that you will actually overestimate individual differences. Because if you think about it, when I, when I ask, are you and I different? I don't mean in what we happened to do over this time when you were watching us. What we want to know about is whether we're different in the underlying distributions out of which our behaviors are being drawn. And if we don't have lots of samples, we get bad estimates of those distributions and they look different from one another, um, even though they might not be, or their differences might be small. And I would caution you that most of what we know about statistical testing 
isn't true is begins with an assumption which is equivalent to the statement that correlation times are short. Um, and so eventually you get into a regime where you have independent samples. And if correlations are long, that's just not true. So a whole set of analysis tools out the window. As you can see um, here, you can easily confuse individual differences for correlations that last long in time. That's sort of obvious. So what we're gonna try and do is we're gonna get at this problem by doing directly. Let's try to analyze the data by looking at the variance across individuals in windows of different size. And let me pause here and say, look, the intuition is the following, right? If there were no individual differences, then the only reason that two individuals seem to be different is because you had a finite sample. And as you make the sample bigger, the differences should get smaller. And your intuition is that the difference, the difference should vary as one over square root of the time or one over the time if you compute a variance instead of a standard deviation. And so what we wanna do is to take that intuition and generalize it to a context where there might be individual differences and there might be power law the case. So let's see how that works. So to be very concrete, what we wanna do is we wanna estimate the probability that the animal will be in behavioral state I, and remember there's a hundred states, and we wanna do this from a sample of duration T. So how do you do that? Well, for the particular animal alpha, remember this variable is one if you're in state I and zero otherwise. So if you just integrate that variable over a window of size capital T divide by T, you get an estimate of the probability. Um, as an aside, Different animals are indexed by different alpha, and observations on different individuals really are independent of each other, in contrast to observations at different times, which are obviously correlated. So what can we do? We can compute the variance of this estimate across individuals. So we take the estimate for one individual, we subtract the mean of across all the individuals, square, average over the um, average over the um, individuals in our sample. And then this still depends on which state we're talking about. And we agreed that we're not interested in the details of what happens in each state. So let's sum over states. So if the correlations are short ranged, so for example, if they decay exponentially, then what you can show is that this quantity um, will always behave at large times as one over T, this is the square root of time intuition, right? This is a variance. So it goes as one over T, not one over square root of T. And if there are individual differences, there'll be a plateau. On the other hand, if you have scale invariant correlations like the power laws that we were talking about, then you'll see a decay that goes as a fractional power of the time, again, with something in the background um, to tell you that there are individual differences. And this is all described in a recent preprint that Josh and I wrote. So that's the idea. If, if correlations were very well behaved, short ranged, nothing interesting going on at long time scales, then the variance across individuals should fall as one over time and there'll be a plateau for individual differences. So let's look at real data. Real data is again, from that first work with Gordon, we have recordings um, that are an hour long for each individual fly. There are 59 flies. I don't know what happened to the 60th fly. Um, I can't believe that we set out to do something with 59. Um, this represents a data set of 20 million video frames, which at the time was astonishingly large. Of course, it has been 10 years, so one can do better. So let's do what, let's just, compute the thing that we talked about computing. Um, and what you see, if you look over time scales that are short of order one second, you see something that looks like it might be one over time, right? This is a linear linear plot. So this looks like it might be one over time, maybe the plateau. Then you say, well, no, 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 no. Let's open our window up a little bit and look at a wider range of time scales. And to do that, I'm gonna look on a semi-log plot and then you know, so everything that you saw here is actually in 
this part up here, but there's still something going on. And in fact, the correlations are decaying very slowly. Maybe there's another exponential decay out here. And this is out to minute, to an order of minute, right? So two minutes, 160 seconds, that's a minute. Um, then you say, well, wait a minute, the recordings are an hour long, so we can do better than this. And if you do that, what you see is that what started uh, now, of course, in order to see the full range of times, use a log log plot. Everything that was happening in here is in um, this part up here. And then somehow what you might have thought was the beginning of an exponential decay or something, it, it's not really exponential decay. It's this sort of curved behavior. Maybe it's going to a plateau, a little hard to tell. So what you do is you just fit and you ask, um, what do you get when you fit the data to something that looks like this? Remember, if it really was short range correlations, you would end up with two delta equals one. Um, and uh, that's not what you see. Um, two delta is more like uh, a third or so. Um, you'll also notice that the plateau is actually much smaller than the variance on the one hour time scale because it seems like this continues to decay. Okay, if this is right, then I can take the estimate that I get of this background, which is variance among individuals, which again is quite small. I can take this and subtract it from the data. And remember, it also has an error bar. So you need to be careful that when you subtract it, you include, you make your errors bigger. Errors correlated with the errors in these points. So there's, you have to do this carefully. And if you do that, um, what you see is right now it's a it's a truly connected correlation because it will decay to zero. And what you see is that the decay really is a power law over three decades um, with this particular exponent. Um, the fact that it is such a clean power law over this rate over this wide range is what allows you to assign a very small error bar here. Um, if someone would like to pause and talk about error bars, we can. Let me emphasize once more that when you have long range correlations, most of your intuition about how to think about errors goes out the window. So you really have to do this in a sort of careful uh, resampling way um, in order to make sense out of things. Um, let me emphasize that the data only extend for about an hour. So you can't go any further here. And when we defined behavioral states, Although the movies have a 10 millisecond, or the frames of the individual frames of the movie are only 10 milliseconds, which is what's out here. Um, in defining the state, we did this spectral analysis that takes windows of order a second. So really you can't get much below here um, and, and see anything that, that is a feature of the data as opposed to a feature of your definition of state. So states are defined on the roughly one second time scale, although of course they're defined, they characterize a window of order one second. Um, of course, you can define them at each instant. Um, and so this part of the decay of correlations is related to that sort of internal structure of the definition of states. And then you see this very clean power law. Um, there's a long history of trying to um, demonstrate power law behaviors in biological systems and in other complex systems. Um, a problem is often, so in the examples that we know about in physics, power laws are asymptotically exact. They sort of get better the closer you look. Um, and it's often been hard to meet that standard. I think we're starting to get close here. Um, but let me make an observation, which is that when you think about a power law, you say, oh, there must be something very special going on. Well, you can always think about a power law as arising from a whole collection of processes, each of which has a correlation time, as long as the correlation times are distributed in the right way. Now, maybe seeing the correlation times distributed in this way is surprising. That's a, that's a different question. But this is, this is not... Um, a model, it's a sort of mathematical equivalence. And if you think about it, 
if you have a system with many degrees of freedom, at least in some approximate scheme, you could think about its normal modes. And the different modes are associated with different time scales. And if the distribution of those time scales is right, then anything that you observe will look like it's a power law decay. And that's actually how it works in, um, in uh, the examples that we understand. That's why seeing one power law in a correlation function isn't enough to convince you that things are scale invariant. Um, it could be a coincidence. In particular, if this isn't true exactly, but it's true approximately, then you might see something that looks an awful lot like a power law, but really isn't quite. And this is the history of um, one over F noise in, in metals, um, which you know looked like it had power law behaviors, but there are small deviations, and those small deviations are actually the clue to understanding um, that what's really going on is you just have a mixture of processes with different time scales. That range of time scales is broad enough that it looks like a power law, but it isn't really. So because of this, you want to see something more. And remember, that when we talked about scale invariance, it's more than just one power law. We said that if you, you know, if you change units in the right way, then you always get back the same behavior. And so one way of thinking about that is that if you computed not the variance across individuals, but the third moment of the variations across individuals, you should see another power law. And the exponent should be related to the power law that we saw with looking at the variance. So that works. Um, of course, the error bars are larger because you're looking at a third moment instead of a second moment. But what's remarkable is that not only do you see a pretty clean power law, but the exponent comes out to be right. So it's three. If the exponent in the first example was two times delta, the exponent here is three times delta. Okay, how about doing something else? Suppose we define state in one window of time. Suppose we took two successive windows of time and define state by what happens in both windows. So now instead of having 100 states, in principle, we have 10,000. That's dangerous because there's too many, but it turns out that most of those never happen. So really, it's only about 1,000 states. So we've taken our description at short times and completely changed it from something that has a, you know, uh, that you update independently every 10 milliseconds to something that you update every 20 milliseconds. And instead of visiting 100 states, you visit 1,000 states. But amazingly, when you compute the uh, this particular uh, variance of probabilities across individuals, it decays with exactly the same exponent. So what's surprising here, uh, and let me, I had wanted to pause and, and talk about this. Um, as I said, getting a power law decay of one correlation function really is just saying there's a distribution of time scales. And if you make this approximately look like this, it'll be okay. And then you start getting into detailed discussions of how close does this have to be to the correct form? Um, and uh, different people will have different views. But if you take the model in which the thing you observe is a mixture of things happening on different time scales, and that mixture works out so that the, the two-point correlation or the variance um, goes with the power two delta, it is not at all clear why the three-point correlation should go with the power three delta. And it's certainly not clear why this strange nonlinear transformation of successive times should recover the same um, exponent. So what I want to say is that we've introduced this quantity, which um, has nice statistical properties, um, which we think of as being the, the sort of variance of, of behavioral probabilities across or state probabilities across individuals. We find that over three decades, the data behave as a power of time with a little bit of background. 
the little bit of background is the result of individual differences. And these are surprisingly small. Um, what's interesting is that if you watch individuals behaving, it looks like they're doing very different things. What this is telling you is that, that they're doing different things because they have long memories of what they've been doing, but they're really sampling things drawn out of the same probability distribution with nearly 1% accuracy. And if you, um, if you think about um, measuring this for variances, for third moments, or for these two time states, of course, the coefficients A and B vary, but the exponent delta, which first of all has a non-trivial value, right? The naive expectation would be um, that it would be a half, right? Um, which is what you get if, if things eventually become independent at long times. Instead, you get this non-trivial value, smaller, 0.18, and you get the same answer no matter which of these three things you measure. And so what this is telling you is that the behavior that we see, complex though it is, is consistent with it, with, or the data are consistent with that behavior being controlled by a single underlying variable, which has scale invariant correlations at least over these three decades. And what's from, what we find surprising is that that's a very precise statement. Um, it didn't have to be that way. And the idea that you can pull something that precise out of these complex data, we sort of feel like, well, probably means we're on the right track in some way, um, even if we're not entirely sure of the correct interpretation. And the dimension of the scaling exponent um, is defined very precisely and reproducibly. Um, I mean, these error, you should think of these error bars um, in part as arising from, you know, if you took your population of 59 individuals and divided it in half, um, what would the variance be? And so that's, that's a contributor to this. There's also the possibility that you can take multiple windows. So you have to be careful. Um, of course, these kinds of scaling behaviors remind us of critical phenomena in, in equilibrium systems. The temptation is to think that, well, we know that these behaviors are driven by the dynamics of some neural network inside the fly. Maybe this means that that neural network is poised near some sort of critical point. That's a very attractive idea, um, which many people have thought about, uh, including my colleagues and I. Um, I want to leave you not with, um, you know, a, a sort of tenuous connection to some particular theoretical view, but rather with the phenomenology, which I, I find quite compelling. I would point out that if you actually look at the experimental data that supports the predictions of uh, these scaling phenomena in equilibrium critical phenomena, uh, they are not often measured over more than three decades. And the exponents are not often defined to that much more accuracy than what we have here. Um, there are examples where you can do better, um, but that you can do better by a couple of orders of magnitude in, in the scaling variable, in this case, time. And so what Josh and his group are doing is developing techniques that allow you to follow the flies not for an hour, uh, but for a week. And of course, over the course of the week, um, the flies are going to age. So you're going to see some secular variations. There's circadian rhythms. There's all sorts of things going on. In an hour, you don't have to think about all those things. Um, but the hope is that we can disentangle them and get uh, essentially um, uh, you know, three more orders of magnitude, or I guess it's two more orders of magnitude, let's see. From an hour to a day is a little more than an order of magnitude, and then to a week is another order of magnitude. So we, sh we should be able to get two more decades. Um, and of course, uh, tools for doing high throughput analyses are getting better. So why are we doing 59 flies? You know, soon we'll do many more. Um, and so the result of all this is that this picture of scaling will be tested um, by the next generation of experiments in vastly more detail. And where I would end is by saying, you know, we have this qualitative impression that there are things happening on many timescales. And I think it's surprising that if you look at the data, you can find hidden in it 
um, this extremely precise statement that those time scales are, are essentially distributed in a statement way um, across these behaviors. So thank you. Thank you, Bill, for a wonderful talk. Uh, I want to, you know, clap on behalf of all of the audience. So there are already some questions. I guess because we are at the end of the talk, audience members who ask questions, if you want to unmute yourselves and ask directly, that's, you know, that we, we can do that. So the first question was from Juan Pedraza. Juan, do you want to unmute yourself and ask directly? Or would you like me to read, read out your question? Sure. Sure. Yeah, sure. I can ask. Uh... Thank you, as always. Uh, I have just one question on the differences on the Bs in the slide that is up right now. The, yeah. Can you can you use that to get at a, so if you assume that the, there is a single underlying variable, could you get at the distribution of the variances between individuals for that variable by looking at the differences in the Bs that you get from different uh, forms of, of, uh, yeah. of um, right I mean I guess the obvious one is is this one where you're comparing the second moment and the third moment yeah for example um, yeah. Uh, yes maybe um part of the problem is remember that the the thing whose moments you're estimating are the probabilities of being in different states and the thing whose dynamics you're sensitive to is some underlying variable so it might, so if I think about building a more explicit model, B also contains, if you will, the derivatives of the state probability with respect to the underlying variable. Okay. And so maybe if, if you don't know those, which of course we don't, I mean, that's a quality, that's a description, right? Sort of an idea for a model. It's not really a model. Um, maybe there's too much degeneracy that if you, if you chose different coefficients that couple the underlying variable to the state probabilities, that obscures differences in the distribution of the underlying variable. That would be my guess. But I think, I mean, I would say that, that um, we feel like we spent a lot of energy to convince ourselves that, I, that everything I've told you is true, but there is a sense that we've just scratched the surface. So there's, there's more to do. I mean, the idea that we're having a conversation about, you know, could you extract the distribution of some underlying control variable without just assuming that it's Gaussian and then waving your hands, um, that seems like progress. So for now, maybe we can pause and, and, and be happy with that. Thank you. Thanks. That was a good question. Uh, next question is from John Bishopper. John? Do you want to unmute yourself and ask directly? Sure, yeah. Um, so it, just going along the lines of, of trying to think about critical points and so forth, um, is there any evidence so far that this uh, exponent that comes out is universal? I mean, if, is there a second um, data set? Have you tried different conditions, different animals, or different different species, et cetera? So uh, in other contexts, I always joke that that we, um, you know, reproducible comes before universal. Okay, well, that's what I meant, like second, is there a second data set? Right, so um, there isn't a second data set. Uh, well, there are by now other data sets and we should do that. Um, of course, the experiments on the 59 different flies are independent of each other. I mean, they're in the same rig, um, but they're, you know, they're collected over a long period of time, um, same time every day and so on. Uh, but, um, and so in some sense, this error bar is about the reproducibility across different subpopulations of the 59. Um, so you get some sense for that. So I would say we've convinced ourselves that things are reproducible under this set of conditions. Um, how universal they are over across different conditions. Um, we know that the states um, show up in, you can find the same states in closely related species of flies. And if you look at the distribution with which they visit the states, the similarities of those probability distributions are a good proxy for evolutionary distance or for minus evolutionary distance. Um, so uh, I think the experiment where we look at closely related species doing this in the same conditions um, 
that seems very feasible and I'd be optimistic, but we don't know the answer. Okay. Thank you. James, I see you have raised your hand. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask? All right. Excellent discussion. I enjoyed very much your um, explanations. Could you go back to the, I think it's the seventh slide. I want to ask you some questions about that. It's the one that's titled Start with High Resolution Video of Walking Flies. Um, what's that? That one, exactly. So, okay, so your analysis depends essentially on the definition of states. And yeah. this, this slide is used to explain how you define states. And my understanding is the critical step is the nonlinear embedding step where you go from the uh, what you define as the spectrum mm -hmm. the spectra uh, and you do some kind of nonlinear um, interactions among the different uh, spectra and you produce this last um, uh, box which then in the bottom right you interpret um, fast leg movements etc cetera, etc cetera. so it seems to me it's really critical in your entire analysis how you do that nonlinear embedding step so I have two questions how do you do it and the second is, are there different ways of doing it? And does your result change if you do it a different way? So um, let me give a multi-part answer. Uh, the first is a, is a slightly sociological answer, which is that I think when we did this, we thought this was a plausible first try. I mean, you're, I mean the big advance is let's do experiments on this scale. Um, and, and then it's, you know, is there some underlying structure that we can pull out? And this was a first try at doing that. Um, there is something that happens in the community where if the first try produces something interesting, it, it solidifies perhaps a little too quickly. Um, so I would, I, I mean, my kind of personal answer is Actually, especially now that we've seen these results, we should go back and redo all of this in other ways and um, uh, more profoundly different ways. Um, the so, okay, I, I'm so getting that, but you're not really answering. No, I didn't. I, that was, I mean, essentially to say that I am with you about the concern. Um, um, okay, in, uh, in, it makes it sound like it's a concern. I just would like to know a little bit more detail. Okay. So about what, we did, the what we did is, is, is called TSNI. Um, and as many of you will know, what this is doing is it's, I mean, each of the things that we start with is a point in a very high dimensional space. And so what you're doing is trying to place those points in a low dimensional space um, so that you preserve something. <laughs> and the thing that you preserve is the relative distances of points that are nearby in the space. So this distance from here all the way across to there doesn't mean anything, but locally distances do mean something in the sense that they are um, a fairly good representation of the um, similarity of the original data. Okay, and so that's, um, uh, that's what you do. Um, you make the choice, the choices that you make are at the beginning are what dimensionality are you going to do it in and how big a neighborhood do you try to preserve, right? Because it's local. So local, you have to tell me how far you're willing to go. Right. Um, we know that if you fiddle with those things over reasonable ranges, you know, you use two dimensions because you can plot it. You can use three uh, for free. Um, almost, uh, it's not any harder. That doesn't matter, you get back the same states. Um, if you change your neighborhood by a factor of two, you get back the same states. Um, so we think that um, from here uh, to there, um, there would be little wiggles um, or little roundings of corners and so on that might happen if we changed if we took the class of dimensionality reduction schemes that we're using and fiddle with how we do it, the details, nothing change, nothing important changes. Now the question is, is there a qualitatively different way of doing it um, that would produce changes? And I think that's a good question. So, okay, all right, thanks. Nope. I, I could ask more, but there's other people who wanna ask questions, mm -hmm. so I'll stop. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, David? You're muted, David. Or we can't hear your voice. How about now? Uh, now is good. Better? Good. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. That was a really great talk. Um, still on this slide. So you mentioned that basically one of the outputs from this analysis is you get 100 some states. And then your subsequent analysis of correlation functions is kind of predicated on that yeah. discrete partition of the states. How I guess how arbitrary is that level of coarse graining of the of the states? Could you have grouped them into six states as you did here, or could you have grouped them into a thousand? And does does kind of the analysis change if you so um So an example is I don't have the reference, but let me let me at least point to the person who did it. Uh, what Basile did um, was he wanted to try and make the goal the goal that he set himself was to make explicit probabilistic models for the sequences. And if you want to do that, then a hundred states is too much, at least understandable as a as a first step. Starting with 100 states seemed very challenging. Uh, you would have to do something arbitrary. And so what we decided to do, so, so what we decided to do was to ask whether we could compress our description of the states and still keep the long-range correlations. So the idea was very simple. Take the 100 states, put them into two states, but choose that mapping so that the mutual information between two successive times was as large as possible, which is to say, of course, it can't be larger than what it started as. So you're preserving as much of it as possible. Importantly, you're only preserving local correlations from one time step to the next. Um, actually, in that analysis, it was from one state to the next because we measured time in units of transitions. But OK, um, that's, that isn't crucial. Um, it turns out that then you can ask, can you build a model that captures the mean of that two-state variable and the correlations in time. And now correlations is the ordinary spin-spin correlation function because it's a two-state system. And the answer is that the model that does that is the one over R squared Ising model, which again, of course, has special scale invariant properties. Um, and so, I mean, maybe the in terms of the direct answer to your question, um, the important point is that you preserve the long range correlations with a massively coarse grained description that was only chosen to preserve local correlations. So we think that the thing we're looking at is robust in that sense. And as you know, but I'll say for the sake of the audience, right? If you think about all the things we understand in critical phenomena, right? If you do some sort of local coarse graining, of course, the long range collective behaviors stay the same. Um, that's the whole point. Um, so that is more anecdotal than it should be, but it is an uh, interesting anecdote. Thanks. Let me, let me say one more thing, which is that um, if you believe that the behavior is scale invariant, then there ought to be something like a, an empirical RG for the, for the sequences of states. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to do that. Um, that also raises the question of whether the states themselves shouldn't emerge from some empirical course. So sh we should be able to use the same coarse graining principle starting at 100 millisecond, uh, at, at 10 milliseconds and going out and not doing this thing of first we get states, then we do something else. And so that would be much more elegant. Um, and that we haven't done at all. But well, thanks. Sure. General? Um, yeah, uh, Bill. So my question actually quite related to what David and John just asked you. Um, because I, my lab, uh, also working on something uh, similarly related, but uh, it's at single cell, cell level. So one thing, I would raise up mine is, you know, the state definition, right? And then you need to do this, uh, uh, you, you also do the dimension reduction. So when you do dimension reduction, then there's a, a question whether how well resolve the cell state, uh, not cell state, in your case, is the, um, there's a, a state. 
let's assume you have a, you know the system move on a manifold, mm -hmm. right? you know, the whole state from a manifold. Let's have a it's a this tube structure, but you really many you you project onto you know you you say the project on two D. We know it's by no means you can preserve the topology, right? So you have uh, two leaves, then you project them to two things. So there are two different states, but you assume there's one state that will make your, uh, you know, you presumably make make your dynamics description very distorted. How how well you think about this? How you you try to uh, convince yourself you won't uh, go into that problem? So remember that. Um, if I have a structure, which is, um, let's see, the one person I'm not seeing is myself. But, uh, hopefully you see my hands. If I have a kind of leaf structure like this, right? Yeah. Then actually these things are far apart from each other. Mm -hmm. So in the procedure that we're using, they will be spread apart still further, right? Because you insist that you preserve short distance relationships and you don't care about the long distance relationships so that means so neighbor means something but global distance does not that's the price that you pay because as you say there's there is no way to do this right um uh and preserve everything so i think the specific thing that you're worried about or the specific thing that you brought up i don't think it's a problem for us um but the more general point that having seen all this, we should now go back and think harder about how you define states. I completely agree. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, launch a kind of global defense of our choice of states. This is where we were, and we decided, okay, can we use this um, to characterize the long-range correlations? That this is what popped out. Um, but I agree with you that 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 we should go back. Um, there was actually in the Q and A, um, uh, uh, written a question which was of the same flavor um, by by an anonymous contributor, which was literally, "Can you use the notion of the observed correlation to recalculate the states of the flies beyond one second?" And so, I mean, this is again, um, as I said in response to David's question, you know, we do one thing on time scales less than one second, and then we do something else on time scales longer than one second. And now that we see the results, you sort of feel like, oh, why did we do that? Um, and well, it's because when we started, we were trying to show that there is some regularity even in this unconstrained exploration. Um, and so the idea that on the one second time scale, you could think of behavior as being um, visiting a uh, hundred different states. That was that was already progress. Um, but I agree that that uh, it would now be nice to do it in a way which was more continuous with what we see um, at longer time scales. I hope that helps. Thank you, <clears throat> Sonia. You had a comment comment slash slash question. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Yes, sure. Um, yeah, thanks so much for a really great talk, Bill. Um, in an answer to one of the other questions, you had said something about um, distributions of states and the frequency of visiting the diff different states varying between different species, and that the difference between those distributions uh, correlates with evolutionary distance between yeah. species. And I was wondering if you have a reference that you could share because that's really fascinating i'd love to read more about that yeah, so that really is gordon's work not okay i mean if i'm remembering correctly i mean we talked about these things but i didn't have anything to do with it mm -hmm. um so uh there is a paper from gordon maybe well after the 2014 paper but i'm not sure okay. exactly um if you don't if you don't find it um uh just send me a note and i will i will see if i can track it down for you. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, but yes, so I mean, just to be clear, um, you know, if I give you probability distributions, I can measure, for example, the kobluk leibler jensen shannon divergence among those distributions. And the answer is that that is very strongly correlated with evolutionary distance, um, mm -hmm. at least within 
I mean, you know, uh, I think it's across the Drosophilid flies or something like that. Um, sure, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't expect it to be, you wouldn't know. Want to go, you wouldn't want to go too far. Um, so we thought, I mean, I, I certainly was, was taken by that yeah. as a kind of um, reassurance that the things we're computing are things the organisms actually care about. Um, right? Uh, you know, it, it, it is, of course, possible that I'm telling you things about the data which are true, but somehow irrelevant. Um, and uh, the fact that, that you can recapitulate evolutionary relatedness, which is measured, of course, by completely independent means, um, sort of makes it feel like maybe maybe these distributions do label um, the behaviors in a, in a meaningful way. Yeah, thank you. Um... Thank you. So I don't see any further questions. Audience members, if you have additional questions, you can unmute yourselves and ask directly or raise your hand. Uh, and Bill, once again, thanks for a wonderful talk. I mean, it oh, was hard. You gave us a choice of four different topics and it was hard to pick this topic, but I think we had a really good you know, discussion and everything. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you.